now, what are they, like a thousand years old? Golly. That's right, that's right, my friend. I do have to be careful. Do this thing, though, or I'll break my hand. Don't break the beams! That's right, friend, that's right. All right. I got a new record out called Rhinestone. Any of you folks have it out here? A lot of support here in Tampere for Rhinestone. It was a fan-supported uh, project, and there was several folks in Tampere who, who advanced bought the record or bought t-shirts or bought stuff to, to help get the record out. It's just me now. <laughs> you know, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to be getting a major label recording contract anymore. So thank you guys for, for, for getting there. It is. Thank you, brother. No, Appreciate really you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do a song off it now. This is one of the most important songs on the record, I think. Certainly to me, anyway. Uh, it's a song about the great Native American war chief, Crazy Horse. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you some stories about Crazy Horse. Because it's such a fantastic, such a compelling story. Crazy Horse was a leader of the Lakota, Ogallala, Cheyenne, uh, Plains Indians tribes, all right, in the 1850s and 1860s. Us white people called them the Sioux, but they called themselves the Lakota or the Ogallala. And Crazy Horse was one of the war chiefs of those, of those bands, of the High Plains Indians. What a lot of people don't know also is that this Lakota-Cheyenne alliance in the 1850s had the strongest military in the world at the time. Their military, their armies, were stronger than any European power. Their armies were stronger than the American army. They were able to, for over 20 years, defend their homelands against the invading white settlers and the, and the, and the American army. Now, Crazy Horse was, as I said, one of the leaders of those, of those war bands, war parties. And my favorite story, he had big, big, big roles in all of them. He was at the Battle of Rosebud. He was at the Battle of, of Greasy Grass, what we call Little Bighorn, Custer's Last Stand. He was with all the battles with the Crow and the Blackfeet. He was all the, with all the battles with the militia and the settlers. He was there every time, every, every battle. But my favorite one is a battle called a Fetterman's Massacre. And Lieutenant Fetterman was a new officer in the American Army. He just graduated from West Point. So he was stationed out in Montana, what's now Montana, to, to, you know, to fight the Sioux. Fetterman told the local newspaper there in Montana that he could ride through the entire Sioux Nation with three companies of cavalry, about 80 men. He said he could ride through the Sioux Nation and conquer the Sioux with 80 soldiers. So his general, those in charge of him, gave him an assignment. He said, you're going to go out and guard the woodcutters in the valley who are cutting firewood for the winter for us. They're hired by, by us, the army. Your job is to guard them from any sort of Sioux that might attack them. Under no conditions, though, are you to go over the first hill. Do not go over that ridge for any reason whatsoever. Stay in the valley or we can see you. And if you get into trouble, we can help. You go over the ridge, we can't help you. So, Fetterman went out. He had 80 soldiers. Took three companies out, cavalry. Good cavalry, well-mounted, well-trained. And they went out there to guard the woodcutters. No problems at all. Late in the afternoon, though, this sort of really old Sioux man came over the ridge. He was kind of limping. He was kind of hunched over. He was, he was leading this really old, lame pony that could barely walk. And he came down to about within 50 meters of the American soldiers. He started yelling at them, insulting them, calling them names. Lieutenant Fetterman said, just leave this old crazy fool alone. Don't pay any attention. Just guard the woodcutters. 
let that guy be. So Crazy Horse then, as you probably have guessed, this was Crazy Horse in disguise. Crazy Horse then, because he wasn't getting anywhere insulting the uh, American soldiers, so he had a breech cloth on, all right? That's like a, a robe around his waist. He had nothing on under this breech cloth. At that moment, he lifted up the breech cloth and mooned the American army. <laughs> he mooned the American army. This, of course, enraged Fetterman. He lost his temper. He ordered all his soldiers to attack and kill that crazy Indian. And he led the charge. They got on their horses, they pulled out their rifles and their swords, and they charged one old Indian, right? Crazy Horse sort of limped along, and he went back up the ridge towards the ridge. The cavalry horse was gaining on him, and right when they bow had caught him, he went over the ridge. The cavalry followed him. They followed old Crazy Horse. And then they were ambushed by 500 Sioux warriors. Now remember what Fetterman said. He said he could defeat the whole Sioux Nation with 80 soldiers. He had said that. Here was his chance. The battle lasted 10 minutes. Every single American soldier was killed. Fetterman was one of the last to die. He committed suicide. Shot himself in the head. So, Crazy Horse, through all the 1850s, that's what he did on a regular basis. He was a military genius. But also, Crazy Horse, he had a big heart. He had what we would call a social conscience. He really cared about his whole society, not just winning battles. There's all kinds of stories about all these old folks in the Lakota tribe and these people that were sick or injured or had mental problems. And they had troubles in the winter staying alive because, you know, it was so cold on the northern plains, much, 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 much like Finland. So Crazy Horse made sure that those old people, especially the old ones who didn't have grandchildren or children, he made sure that they had ponies and buffalo robes and teepees and firewood, very important firewood, and made sure that they had their, their pouches, their parfletches filled with food for the winter. He didn't order anybody else to do that. He did it all himself out of his own stores. He wasn't a rich man himself. He was too busy really fighting for his tribes to really, to really be making a lot of riches by hunting buffalo. So he gave pretty much everything he had to those old people most of the time, didn't even tell them he was doing it. He just sort of placed them at night around their, their little huts. Now, when the 1850s ended into the 1860s, things started to change for the Lakota and the Ogallala and the Cheyenne. The American Army won the American Civil War. The Union Army won. So they sent their best officers out west to fight the last remaining free peoples on the plains, the Lakota. The Lakota began to take serious casualties but not in battle. They continued to win every battle they fought with the American army. But the American army had learned in the Civil War, the Union soldiers had learned, if you're gonna defeat a whole, a whole culture, you have to destroy the culture. So they went after, first, the buffalo. They ran off the buffalo, they killed the buffalo all around the Lakota camps. They would not attack the braves, the warriors, they would attack the teepees and the horse herds. They would run off all the horse herds or shoot the ponies. They would burn the teepees, destroy the food. So gradually, the Lakota and the Ogallala had nothing even to eat. And one by one, the little bands surrendered to the reservation. One tribe stayed out though. After Greasy Grass, Little Bighorn, there was only one tribe left. That was under Crazy Horse. That winter of 77 and 76 was terribly cold. The coldest on record on the North American continent. They froze to death, they starved to death. They were so hungry 
They couldn't even have the strength to take the dead out of their camp. That spring, Crazy Horse knew it was time to make a decision, the hardest decision of his life. He knew he had two choices. One, either fight the American army in one last battle, which they were sure to lose. By this time, they were outnumbered 100 to 1. So he could either fight this last battle and die with glory on the battlefield or surrender to the reservation. All of his heart and soul wanted to fight one last battle. The few braves he had left, the few warriors he had left, they agreed. Let's fight the American army one more time and die with dignity and honor. The crazy horse, remember he said, I said he was really protective of his old people and the sick people and the lame and the injured and the sick. He decided he couldn't do that to them because he knew that if he wasn't there to protect them and to be their advocate, that they would be treated very poorly. So he decided to surrender. Rode in one beautiful spring day, had his last pony, white pony. On his lap, he carried his favorite rifle, a Winchester repeating rifle. Ironically, it had been given to him by one of the white officers earlier, long ago. He rode up the trail and the people all came out of the reservation, all the Lakota and the Cheyenne. They lined the roads and they cheered for their leader. They cheered for their king as he came in. There was a young white officer there to take his surrender. This officer was terrified. This was Crazy Horse, the greatest warrior on the North American continent. And he had to meet this guy and take his rifle. Crazy Horse came up. He could see this young white officer was, was shaking in his boots. So he said, Sir, I surrender my rifle. Handed him his rifle. The young officer, in shaky voice, said back, You don't ever have to surrender to me, Crazy Horse. It is I who should be surrendering to you. So Crazy Horse then lived on the reservation, but it didn't work. He really tried, he really tried to get along with the whites and with the Indians who had made peace with the whites. He tried really hard. But there's this really crazy, weird story. There's, there's this French-Canadian fur trapper who was on the reservation. He had intermarried with the Sioux, but he also was allied with the American army. He was paid by the American army to interpret what the Sioux were saying. And Crazy Horse had heard that the Nez Perce in Idaho were going on the warpath. They were leaving the reservation and they were going to attack the American army. Crazy Horse told this drunk French Canadian fur trapper, you tell the American general who was, who was right there, you tell him that I will join the American army and I will fight with them and destroy the Nez Perce, every one of them. This drunk fur trapper and we don't know why he did this, whether he was just completely out of his mind with alcohol or whether he wanted to destroy Crazy Horse, we don't know. But he told the white general, sir, this Indian has just said he's going to join the Nez Perce and attack the American army and kill every soldier. The general freaked out, of course. They were terrified of Crazy Horse still, even though he was disarmed. They were terrified he would lead another rebellion. So, he decided they would arrest Crazy Horse. They would arrest him, and the plan was to put him in chains, put him in a, a prison wagon, and take him back east to stand trial in the east for treason against the United States. For political reasons, he decided to have the tribal police arrest Crazy Horse. The tribal police were Lakota. They had been hired by the American army to keep peace. They were, they were police, that's what they were. So he hired them, the general told them, ordered them to go get Crazy Horse and arrest him. They went out to his little hut on the edge of the reservation. A little mud hut covered up with branches, a little 
buffalo robe for a door. Crazy Horse was there with his wife and his kids and his parents and one very special friend of his who was always there kind of covering his back. This friend is always had always been with Crazy Horse through all the battles he had ever fought. So these tribal police, there was 50 of them. They were ar armed very heavily with clubs and knives, big long knives. They yelled at Crazy Horse to come out in Lakota. Crazy Horse pulled aside the buffalo robe, stepped out into the sun, looked around, and my God, he knew immediately, these people, my people, are here to arrest me. They're going to throw me in prison, in jail. This was the last thing Crazy Horse wanted. He would rather die than go to prison. So what did he do? What choice did he have? It's him against 50. He reached over. There was an old bush, kind of a dead old bush. He broke off a branch. I reached over and grabbed a rock. And at that moment, he took a really deep breath and he charged all 50 of those police people of his Lakota. In the beginning, he was actually winning the fight. He was actually defeating 50 other warriors. They made a circle around him, though, and they got closer and closer. And finally, they clubbed him, and he went down. And a few of them stabbed him. Three hours later, he passed away in the presence of his wife and his parents and that special friend. They buried him, the authorities, the soldiers, buried him in the tribal cemetery. It was a Christian cemetery on the reservation. A very standard 19th century American cemetery, graveyard. With the little stones, the little crosses, all that. This story is true, y'all. A few days later, his parents and that special friend, and by the light of the moon, at the middle of the night, snuck out to that graveyard. They didn't even own a shovel or an axe or a pick. With their hands, they dug away the dirt from Crazy Horse's body. Then they lifted him out of the dirt and they hand carried him. They didn't have a horse. They, they carried him several miles off of the reservation into the beautiful high plains. And there they buried him and covered up the tracks. To this day, we do not know where Crazy Horse is buried. This was very important to his parents and that friend because so many Native American chiefs, their graves had, turned, had been turned into a tourist attraction. A, a sort of horrible commercial thing. So, during COVID, I was trying to write this song about Crazy Horse. I really wanted it. I really wanted to do a great song about Crazy Horse, the greatest American of the 19th century. Couldn't get it. Tried, just couldn't get it. Then one night, I was sleeping, and it just sort of came to me, kind of in a half dream, I was sort of half awake, and the idea hit me all at once to know, don't write the song about Crazy Horse from his point of view, or from the white point of view. Write about Crazy Horse from the point of view of that special friend he had, his best friend. Write about what that guy went through, both before, both during and after Crazy Horse's life. So then, the lines came quick. <laughs> the music, the riff, all of it just happened really, really fast. So fast, I couldn't even have time to write it down. I just sort of hummed it into my, my, my phone thing. It was half dark, I was half asleep. Just line after line after line, verse after verse after verse. Edited it through the next day, and finally brought it down to eight verses. Uh, it's over eight minutes long, the longest song I've ever written, as a matter of fact. So, now that you know a little bit about Crazy Horse, um, I'm going to finally sing you this song that I'm so proud of. This song is called, I Rode 
with Crazy Horse. I rode with Crazy Horse I stood by him through his divorce I stood by him when others ran I stood by him when war began I have no shame or dark remorse Cause once I rode with Crazy Horse They say this year is 1904 you're a college professor Here to write down what I say From a day so far away And that our cause did you endorse? Well, once I rode with Crazy Horse Sharpen up your pencil good Finally I'll be understood At greasy grass we face Custer And all the power he could muster I did my part to reinforce When I rode with Crazy Horse It wasn't all that long ago the crow and black me too we fought folks that look like you i don't care much for you of course once i rode with crazy horse Tribe surrendered to reservations all dismembered but a few of us stayed out for a year we fought the doubt that we could beat relentless force when I rode with crazy horse on his day of reckoning Staff the hero of our nation I tried to take that blade of course When I rode with Crazy Horse No one looks and no one goes. So no one can desecrate or Christianize his final fate. By a dried up water course, when I rode with Crazy Horse. My wife died in 1901. This reservation's lots of fun. Sit around to get my food And whiskey puts me in the mood I scream until my voice is hoarse And once I rode with Crazy Horse Once I rode with Crazy Horse Once I rode
rode with Crazy Horse. Once I rode with Crazy Horse. Yes, I did. God bless you, Crazy Horse. Hold on, Tonga. You were talking.